Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to just cover some assorted psychiatric disorders that don't really fall under all the umbrellas we've touched on so far. Now, some of these disorders, uh, or most of them rather, are less prevalent in patient populations than other disorders like anxiety or depression, but they're still fair game. You, you have to know them for step one, you have to know them for CK, you'll have to know them for step three. So let's dive in. The first one I want to talk to you about here is trichotillomania. Now, this is a condition characterized by hair loss. And that's actually due to the patient's own pathological recurring pulling out of their own hair. Now, this is a behavior that the patient is well aware that they're doing, and they've made repeated efforts to stop, but it still continues. Now, the behavior here can't be attributed to other medical conditions. So, say, for example, the patient has a dermatologic condition that causes pruritus or irritation um, that causes them to scratch their hair away. That wouldn't qualify as trichotillomania. Additionally, the behavior is not better explained by symptoms of another mental disorder. So for example, a patient with body dysmorphic disorder, maybe they're perceiving that their hairline is not that strong and they're intentionally pulling out their hair to try and improve that defect or flaw. That, of course, still wouldn't qualify, okay, because that would be due to a different disorder. And finally, the symptoms uh, associated with the condition cause distress and or impairment in some domain of functioning, whether that's work, social life, personal life, or other domain. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Now, the treatment for trichotillomania is going to be with cognitive behavioral therapy that's, that is going to be tailored to the specific disease state. Now, this could include habit reversal training, which includes the ability to recognize situations where hair pulling is likely, and then substituting that behavior with another that's not as damaging. So, for example, fist clenching. Every time you have that urge, clench your fists and count to 10. Something along those lines. All right, moving on. Another condition we need to talk about that's similar to trichotillomania, but instead of pulling out their hair, involves the skin. Now, this is skin picking disorder, and it's characterized by the presence of skin lesions, and those are the result, as I mentioned, of constantly picking at their skin. This one's easy to spot because you'll see people just constantly picking at their skin, and you'll see lesions on their body. Again, this is a behavior that the patient is aware that they're doing. They've made repeated efforts to stop, but it's not been successful. Now, the skin picking, of course, as always, can't be uh, due to some other medical condition. So it can't be they have psoriasis in, in their scratching or eczema. It also can't be due to substance use substance use or abuse. So this isn't skin picking when seeing hallucinations while on LSD or skin picking because of a withdrawal or side effect of opioids. This is just a, a behavior that is uh, seen when all those other things are not present. Now, you also can't better explain the symptoms um, due to other psychiatric disorders. Uh, this is not self-mutilation or self-mutilating behavior that we see with uh, certain personality disorders like borderline, nor would it be tr trying to improve a defect as seen in a uh, body dysmorphic disorder like I mentioned in the last slide. And of course, these symptoms cause distress and they cause impairment in some domain of functioning. Like I said, work, personal life, social life, any other domain. Keep that in mind. Now, as far as treatment goes, there's a few different components that we need to consider. If the patient has developed an infection, then appropriate antibiotics, incision, uh, and drainage, and or surgery may be warranted as well, depending on the type and degree of infection present. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be fairly effective in these patients. As for pharmacology, your first-line treatment should be SSRIs, and that's typically as far as you're going to need to go for CK. But occasionally, um, based on clinical judgment, atypical antipsychotics may be used in patients with delusions. And occasionally, N acetylcysteine is used as well because it's been shown to decrease the severity of a patient's symptoms. So, like I said, you probably don't need to know that. Make sure you know SSRIs are first line, but it's important to always toss in these little caveats to your um, treatment. All right, let's move on to kleptomania. This is a condition, of course, whereby patients experience that increased sense of tension immediately before stealing, which is then replaced by relief, gratification, or pleasure at the time of stealing an object. Now, the patient will tell you that they experience repeated failures to resist the impulse to steal objects. Um, and these objects are not needed for monetary value or for personal use. And that's a really big differentiating factor here. If you've got a patient who's stealing items to sell for money, or they're stealing items for their own personal use to feed their family, that's not kleptomania. Okay? Also, patients may feel, while they may feel relief, 
uh, that gratification, pleasure, when they're committing the, 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 the crime, when they're stealing, they actually can have feelings of guilt or remorse afterwards, and they will acknowledge that stealing is in fact wrong. Now, they may even give away or even throw away the items they're stealing. So this is pathological stealing. It's not just shoplifting. They steal it, and then they have no use for it. They throw it away. So it's really important when you're reading a vignette that you're looking very, very closely for those little nuggets that will point you in either direction. All right. Now, this is, of course, not due to a delusional disorder or hallucinations or as part of any other psychiatric condition. Okay, so... Think kleptomania when the behavior is an isolated condition revolving around that tension, which then gets relieved by stealing objects, which are of absolutely no use to the patient. Okay, now remember, something you want to keep in mind is any relationship to personality disorders. And this is not due to conduct disorder. Um, this is not due to antisocial personality disorder. And a patient who is bipolar and in a manic episode who's stealing you wouldn't classify it as kleptomania. So really important just to keep those little caveats in mind. Now, there's currently no FDA-approved medication to help treat kleptomania. So you're not going to be tested on pharmacotherapy. Um, but as far as treatment goes, the treatment of choice is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, we can use things like aversion therapy, which is when we physically make the patient feel uncomfortable when they get that urge to steal. Or there's something else called covert sensitization. And this is when you you have the patient visualize the negative consequences of being caught stealing. Okay, so, you know, drugs aren't going to help with this. What's going to help is reframing the way you approach day-to-day -day life so that you can replace the bad behaviors with more productive ones or at least less damaging ones. All right, next up we have pyromania. This is the disorder characterized, of course, by the deliberate and purposeful setting of fires occurring on more than one occasion. Now, the patient experiences a complete fascination with fire and the consequences of setting a fire, as well as fire-related paraphernalia, whether that's fire-starting equipment, firefighting gear, etc. Now, what you'll see in a vignette is the patient will report tension or even arousal prior to setting a fire, and then when setting the fire or even witnessing the fire that or, or witnessing a fire, they experience pleasure, they experience relief and gratification. So it's kind of similar in a way to kleptomania, where they have that tension and that excitement. And then when the when, when whatever it is that they do to relieve that is done, they have that sense of relief. Okay, very, very interesting. As always, remember, this is not due to any other psychiatric condition, not due to some sort of hallucinations, delusions. And one thing imp really important to keep in mind, because you want to make sure you're looking for this in a vignette, is the patient here is not starting the fire to draw attention to themselves. So that's really important. Uh, obviously, you know, someone who is starting fires to bring attention to themselves, you're not going to say is, is, is it has pyromania. Um, so really, really, really important to make sure you keep that in mind so that you don't get led astray on exam day. Now, treating pyromania will include cognitive behavioral therapy as well as aversion therapy. And on a case-by-case -case basis, a number of medications have actually been shown to improve the symptoms of pyromania. This is going to include things like SSRIs, anxiolytics, uh, anti-epileptic medications, lithium, atypical antipsychotics, as well as anti-androgens, anti, uh, but that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. So as opposed to kleptomania, where there's no FDA-recommended medication for pyromania, Got a laundry list. Okay, so really important to keep that in mind. All right, let's jump into a different topic now and talk Tourette syndrome. Of course, if you've never seen this, it's very, very unusual to see. Um, it's very unfortunate for those who have this because it's 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 a condition characterized by uncontrollable tics, which can be abrupt, brief, uh, intermittent. They can be vocal. They can be motor. It's it's a tough one to um, you know have to be, have to uh, deal with. Now, the tics are generally involuntary, but they can actually be temporarily voluntarily suppressed, but they can't be suppressed in an ongoing manner. Now, if you've never seen this, head over to YouTube, and I want you to just Google or type into the search engine a Tourette syndrome example and see what this looks like if you've never seen it, because it's very, very fascinating. At least I find it to be fascinating. Now, tics are categorized as either simple 
or complex. And some common examples of simple motor tics would be things like facial distortions, head jerking, uh, blinking, shrugging, whereas complex tics, especially complex motor tics, would include things like uh, uh, copropraxia, which is involuntarily performing obscene gestures, or inappropriate touching, uh, echopraxia, which is involuntarily mimicking the gestures of others. Uh, so someone does something and you're involuntarily you know, doing the same thing. Could get some people in trouble, um, but you know, it's involuntary. Uh, other full body flinching, kicking, jumping, these are other examples of complex motor tics. Simple phonic tics, which are the, the verbal tics, the simple ones include things like screaming, uh, clearing the throat, grunting, barking. Uh, complex tics include things like echolalia, which is involuntary and uh, repetitive repetition of another person's spoken word. So someone says something, you repeat it. Someone else says something, you repeat it. Okay, of course, that's going to be uh, obnoxious to the onlooker, but uh, if they know that the condition is there, then it's involuntary and it's understandable. Uh, another complex phonic tick is coprolalia. This is involuntary as well, and it's repeating uh, the use of, of obscene words. Um, very interesting to see. Uh, and uh, again, go to YouTube if you want to see what this looks like, because it's very, very interesting. Uh, another one is palilalia. Palilalia is, of course, involuntary, and it's the, the repetitive repetition of a phrase or word with increasing rapidity. So you might have a, a phrase, uh, and then you say it's a little faster, a little faster, a little faster, and you just do it again and again and speed it up, etc. The diagnostic criteria for Tourette's is going to include, of course, the presence of both motor and um, motor tics and one phonic tick. And often there are more than one present. So it could be like a complex mix of different ticks, but you want to see both motor and phonic ticks. Now, while the motor and phonic ticks don't have to occur at the same time period, they must be present at some point in the patient's history. Now, ticks occur multiple times a day, almost every day. Uh, they can be intermittent throughout a period of, of time, uh, but typically for more than a year. Now, there is an evolution in the patient's tick, ticks over time, and it's important to recognize that they don't remain static. So the, the, the ticks might uh, change based on location. The frequency might change. The type you might have a lot of motor, and then it turns to a lot of vocal. Uh, the severity can change. The complexity, it's all really uh, a very evolving type of condition. Um, as far as age goes, the age of onset of ticks should be seen before 18 years of age in order to make your diagnosis. And the ticks cannot be explained by medical conditions, uh, substance use, uh, drugs, alcohol, things like that, right? You always want to rule those things out. And in order to diagnose this, the, you as the physician needs to at least see them, or you need to see a video where they were um, performing these motor or vocal ticks. You can't just go based on history. You need to see it. Now, when it comes to treatment, it depends on the severity. Mild non-disabling ticks, um, these can be treated with things like educating the patient, supportive care, as well as counseling. Um, if ticks are causing some sort of functional impairment or problems, we can treat this with comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks called CBIT. That would be first line. Uh, a second line is going to actually be uh, pharmacotherapy if CBIT is unavailable, and that would be with the medication tetrabenazine. One more condition here is hoarding disorder. If you've seen the TV show Hoarders, you know what this looks like. It's very troubling. This is just basically a condition where patients have an extreme difficulty parting with possessions, even if they have no actual value or even sentimental value. So these are not people collecting items. Uh, they are not people who are keeping items who, that have sentimental value. These are just people accumulating stuff with no utility, no value, okay? Uh, commonly hoarded items. I mean, if you've seen the TV show, hoarders, uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, clothing, especially clothing that's never going to be worn again, appliances that aren't used or are broken, just it can really be anything. Now, patients with hoarders, uh, hoarding disorder find that getting rid of possessions is difficult, and this is because they have an intense need to save the items and they develop severe feelings of distress associated with uh, discarding them. So again, if you've ever seen Hoarders or if you haven't, I suggest watch an episode, you'll get a perfect idea. You'll see when, when experts come in and start cleaning out their, um, their homes, they get agitated, angry, um, 
upset and it's because they just have this uh, they, this distress when they think of getting rid of things now the inability to discard possessions of course leads to an accumulation of items that's going to completely overwhelm their living space it's going to compromise the use of the area it can be dangerous um, it can be actually you know very very uh troubling if there's children in the home animals in the home oftentimes on the show hoarders you'll see uh, you know, dead animals under years worth of newspapers, and magazines. So it's, you know, it's very, very troubling. Um, not only that, but when you have years and years of dried newspapers, and magazines, it's going to be a huge fire hazard, right? This is flammable material and it's going to go up in flames very quickly. Um, and if a patient's a bit older, guess what? They're putting themselves at an increased risk of falling, perhaps breaking a hip or breaking a bone because there's stuff everywhere. All right. The last thing I want to just point out here is the hoardings associated with this. It's not due to another medical condition or some sort of mental illness. It is its own disorder. So for example, if you have a patient with delusions or hallucinations um, that let's say they're being observed and so they want to keep their living space full of electronics to sort of throw off the monitoring, that would not be hoarding disorder. That would, of course, be some sort of other mental condition. Now, when it comes to treatment, first and foremost, what you want to do is address any immediate safety risks by ensuring um, the risk of fire, uh, floor collapse, tripping um, is addressed. That's first. Then we're going to implement cognitive behavioral therapy, first line, and any comorbid, uh, comorbidities that are present. So like uh, anxiety, depression, we want to address those and treat those appropriately based on whatever the most appropriate medications for those would be. So for example, so for example, uh, you know, SSRIs, medications like that. All right, let's move on to the content review questions. As always, I'll give you 20 seconds on the clock, but feel free to hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. correct answer here is D, trichotillomania. Next question. I'll give you 20 seconds on the clock, but feel free to hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is C, kleptomania. And our final question, I'll give you 20 seconds on the clock or you can hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is B. All right, that is the end of this lecture. We've got a couple more in psych. I will see you on the next one.